All right. Hello. Welcome, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome you to the next event in our webinar series. And this will be a presentation by uh, Professor Thomas Corbett on a very exciting topic of quantum optomechanics. Uh, my name is Garrett Cole, I'm the technology manager at Thorlabs Crystalline Solutions located in Santa Barbara, California, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Thomas is a professor at Louisiana State University, and he obtained his PhD in physics from MIT in 2008, joining the Department of Physics and Astronomy at LSU in 2011. His research focuses on quantum metrology for gravitational wave detection. Uh, as was mentioned in the video, uh, throughout Thomas's talk, feel free to submit any questions you may have through the Q&A tool, and Thomas will be answering those uh, at the end of the presentation. So now at this time, I want to hand it off to Thomas and look forward to his presentation. Uh, thank you, Garrett, for the introduction and the opportunity uh, to talk today. So I'm going to be talking about quantum optomechanics at the standard quantum limit. You may notice that we use the word quantum twice here, which is a little bit by accident, but it's it's kind of a hot buzzword right now. So everything you put quantum in is inherently um, more interesting and, and cooler. Uh, so just briefly, I want to list some of the collaborators for the results that I'll talk about here. Um, the LSU students who have worked on this in the past are uh, Ravi Singh, John Kripe, Safura, Khalil and Tori, and then we have Ronald and Scott are the current ones. And we also work together with groups uh, from MIT, uh, Nergis Mobilevala's group. Um, Garrett actually made many of the device made the devices that uh, I'll be describing today. Uh, so most of the work is made possible uh, by that uh, work by Garrett. Um, we collaborate with a group at the Australian National University uh, for using squeeze light in these experiments. And then we also uh, work together with Benno Wilkie's group at uh, the MPI uh, for some work. Um, so uh, before we dive in, I just want to advertise if there are any undergraduate students who uh, are watching, or if you know undergrad students who may be interested in doing some research, um, we at LSU have an RU program, which is a 10 week program in the summer where we bring in students from all over the country to do research with the professors here in the physics department. Uh, of course, we welcome students who are interested in the topics I'll be discussing today, but we ha are actually a pretty large physics department with a wide range of research topics that you can see listed on the right here. Uh, so if you're interested or you know people who might be interested, please uh, forward uh, this information uh, to them. So for today, we'll talk about um, the, this quantum optomechanics. And so this, there's basically three parts to this talk. The first part, I'll talk about the motivation for the experiments we do. And really, there are two pieces to this. The, the biggest piece is that we want to be able to make gravitational wave detectors uh, more sensitive so that we can see further out into the universe uh, and so that the events that we do detect, we can measure with greater signal to noise ratio so that we can uh, learn more about the physics that are going on in these uh, binary and spiral. So black holes and spiraling or neutron stars and spiraling to each other. Um, on the other hand, we also, um, to do this, to make these as sensitive as possible, we need to understand how to perform quantum measurements at a very fundamental level. So the techniques and the tricks that we learn to make gravitational wave detectors can be used for any sort of experiment where you're doing very, very high precision uh, measurements. So just understanding basic quantum mechanics uh, is also a big motivation here. Uh, after that, we'll go on to some of the prior uh, experimental results. And then finally, we'll talk about the latest results, which is a uh, sub SQL or standard quantum limit um, experiment. So um, general relativity is the best uh, current uh, theory that we have for how gravity works. It replaced uh, Newton's theory of gravity um, back in the early 20th century. And as part of this theory, the, the, re the real key part of it, or one key part of it, is that uh, gravity is not an instantaneous force between massive objects, but rather it's the curvature of uh, space-time itself. And uh, a key part of this theory is that the effect of gravity does not travel instantaneously, but is communicated at the speed of light. So in other words, when uh, your configuration of mass changes, so if the sun moves or the earth moves or the moon moves, 
the information about its gravity does not uh, tell the rest of the universe that it's moved instantaneously, but it, it's limited by the speed of light. And once you make this realization, uh, you can come to the prediction that gravitational waves should exist. And so gravitational waves are um, disturbances in the fabric of space-time that when you have uh, accelerating masses, uh, it basically creates ripples in the space-time that uh, creates this wave that travels outward from the event. Um, a famous quote by John Wheeler for this is that space-time tells matter how to move. In other words, gravity is not a force, but as objects move through space, they experience the curvature of space-time, which affects their trajectory. And in turn, matter tells space-time how to curve. So the matter also tells uh, space-time how, what shape it should take on. <clears throat> so I mentioned gravitational waves are ripples in this fabric of space-time. They travel at the speed of light. And the effect they have is that they stretch and squeeze uh, space as they travel past an object, which is uh, depicted here in the animation on the bottom left. Uh, so basically, if you imagine you had a, a set of test masses floating freely in space and a gravitational wave came past, it's not that the test masses themselves would move in response to the wave, but the space between them would get stretched and squeezed as the wave traveled past. So that's what you're seeing in the animation. <clears throat> So to create these events, uh, to create these gravitational waves um, to a degree that's measurable, you need very, very massive objects which are uh, changing their uh, configuration very rapidly. And so far, the types of events that we've seen are these binary in spirals. So these are things like a pair of black holes or a pair of neutron stars or a black hole and a neutron star that are in a very, very close orbit to each other and as they orbit each other, they emit gravitational waves, which carries away energy, which then makes the objects fall closer and closer to each other. And as time goes on, they get closer and closer, and they eventually uh, merge into a single object. Um, and so this talk is not about gravitational waves. This is just to lay out a little bit of the motivation. Um, if you want to learn more about gravitational waves, uh, there's actually a ThorLabs webinar um, from last month, I believe, from Dave Wrightsey that you could take a look at. You can also go to the websites for the LIGO uh, collaboration, the Virgo collaboration, or the CAGRA collaboration. So these are the uh, US, European, and Japanese uh, uh, groups that uh, build the detectors that make these discoveries possible. So <clears throat> that that's a brief overview of gravitational waves. Now, um, why, for example, did gravitational waves take 100 years to be measured? So they were predicted in the early, early 20th century. And the first one was not observed until uh, 2015. Why did it take so long? There's, the main reason it took so long is the effect of the waves is extremely small. Uh, we denote the strength of the waves in terms of their strain, which is a fractional length change that they, that they create. And that fractional length change is on the order of a part in 10 to the 21. Um, so when you build a large interferometer, so LIGO works by building, measuring the distance between mirrors that are uh, two and a half miles apart, <clears throat> it creates a, a path, uh, it creates a, a length change between those two mirrors of about 10 to the minus 18 or 10 to the minus 19 meters, which is extremely, extremely small. Uh, and so one of the big things we have to worry about is how do we build detectors that are actually sensitive enough to measure those small displacements. Uh, and when you work really hard, um, you end up with a limiting noise budget, uh, which is shown here on the right. This is sort of a design uh, noise budget for advanced LIGO. Um, the key, well, all of the noises are important, um, but the one that we're focused on today is the quantum fluctuation. So you see um, in purple, the first one are these quantum fluctuations, which are actually limiting the noise across uh, most of the frequency band of advanced LIGO. So there are two types of quantum noise that come into play here at higher frequency, where it is sort of um, flat and then curves up. 
that part of the quantum noise is attributed to shot noise. And this is basically a result of the fact that the laser that we use to measure the distance between the mirrors is made up of discrete quanta of energy. It's subject to quantum mechanics. So basically the, the lasers that we use are made up of photons. And when we ultimately measure our signal, we're essentially counting photons. And when you count uh, discrete numbers of objects, there's inherent uncertainty in the arrival time of those photons on your detector. And that creates some noise in your detector. Um, and that is what we call shot noise. So in advanced LIGO, this limits us um, from a, about 100 hertz and upward. Um, this is noise uh, scales as the square root of the power in the interferometer. And so one of the big motivations in basically for the entire existence of gravitational wave interferometers has been to use as much laser power as possible uh, to reduce the effect of this shot noise. Uh, because it's been a limitation for a long time. <clears throat> now, there's a second uh, form of quantum noise that eventually starts to become a limit uh, as you keep increasing the laser power. And this is what we call quantum radiation pressure noise or back action noise. And the idea is that that um, uncertainty in the arrival time of the photons Yes, it, it, it impacts what happens at the detector, but you also have to remember that these photons reflect off the mirrors in the interferometer. And so when these photons reflect off the mirror, um, they actually impart a little force onto the mirror. They put a little impulse onto the mirror. And if the stream of photons was perfectly even and there are no little uh, fluctuations, that would just be a constant pressure which would push the mirrors back. But if there are fluctuations in the arrival time of the photons, which we know there are, that will actually exert a fluctuating pressure on the test masses, which will actually make them physically move in response to that fluctuating power. And that effect uh, cannot be distinguished from a gravitational wave. It, it, it shows up in exactly the same way as a gravitational wave. Uh, so this is what we call uh, radiation pressure noise, uh, quantum radiation pressure noise, if it's shot noise limited. Uh, and you can see in the budget, this is expected to be the limit down at lower frequencies. So sort of tens of hertz is where we expect that to be uh, the limitation. Uh, and this power, uh, sorry, this, this noise, because it uh, depends on how many photons are hitting the mirror, actually gets worse as you increase the power. So... <clears throat> um, Although you try to use more and more power to make the shot noise lower, it has a side effect of making this radiation pressure noise worse. Uh, so you get this uh, conflicting um, motivation. Do you want high power to lower shot noise or low power to uh, lower radiation pressure noise? And up until very recently, the radiation pressure noise was small enough that it was buried under other noises. So you see at low frequency, there are all kinds of other noises. There's thermal noise, there's seismic vibrations. Uh, there's lots of th technical noises as well that contribute at lower frequency. And the radiation pressure noise was essentially buried under that. But uh, in the last few years, that started to, to change. And the quantum radiation pressure noise is becoming a limit. And so it's not making the detectors more sensitive is not as easy as just using more laser power uh, anymore because we are limited to this interplay between the two. Now, how can we do better? How do we improve the sensitivity in the presence of this quantum noise? Um, the, I say most straightforward, it, it was not always the most obvious and straightforward way, but uh, today, it's, it's been so ingrained in the community that it's just assumed people will, will do this. The, the w one way to do better is to use squeezed light. Um, so we call it quantum squeezing here. And the idea here is that if you know a little bit about quantum mechanics, you will have learned about the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which tells you when you measure two complementary observables, for example, position and momentum of a particle, uh, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle places a limit on the uncertainty in the product of those two observables. So in other words, if you measure position very precisely, you do not know the momentum of the particle very precisely or vice versa. But it doesn't 
limit how precisely you can make the measurement of one or the other, just as a product of the two has to be at a certain level. And the quantum noise can be viewed um, in this light. Um, it's basically you apply the, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle to the electromagnetic field of the laser. And instead of position and momentum, it applies to the quadratures of the laser light. And so the easiest way to think of those are, uh, is to think of the phase and uh, amplitude of the laser light that you are allowed under the Heisenberg uncertainty principle to make the phase noise, for example, very small at the expense of making the amplitude noise very big or vice versa. And so here, um, uh, uh, the diagram shows a vacuum state, which would just be the vacuum fluctuations with no laser field. A coherence state, you see some uh, displacement from the origin and then some uncertainty around that. And here you would see your squeezed light state where you have, um, in, in this case, it's not squeezed in either amplitude or phase, it's squeezed at some, at some angle. But it was realized that you could apply this in gravitational wave detectors by Carlton Caves all the way back in 1981. And so the idea is if you want to reduce shot noise, you would squeeze the phase noise um, in the interferometer and that would reduce shot noise. But of course, at the same time, it would make the radiation pressure noise worse because it would make the amplitude fluctuations worse. Or you could do the reverse where you squeeze the amplitude fluctuations to make radiation pressure noise uh, lower, but it would make shot noise worse. Now, uh, there are some tricks that I'll mention uh, in just a second on how you can avoid that interplay. Uh, of course, a natural question is, how do you create squeezed light? Um, this is Jonathan Kripe, one of the, the grad students, uh, attempting to make squeezed light here by squeezing the laser, but of course that doesn't actually do anything. Um, but we've had several groups in the community who over the past several decades have developed uh, the technology to create squeezed light sources that are capable of improving gravitational wave detectors. So uh, this is a publication back in 2019 that describes how a squeezed light source was installed uh, in the advanced LIGO interferometers and how much it improved the sensitivity. Um, so uh, it's essentially the squeezed light is created using a nonlinear crystal, which is in this OPO cavity. This is um, opti optical parametric oscillator. Um, but basically in a nonlinear crystal, it creates correlations between sidebands of the field that if you are clever in how you set this thing up, uh, will create this squeezed light. And then when you combine it with the light in the interferometer, by controlling the phase between the squeeze, squeeze vacuum and the interferometer light, you can make either amplitude squeezing or phase squeezing. So everything over here on the left is to generate the squeezing. It then goes into the interferometer. And one interesting thing to note, uh, which may seem surprising at first, is the uh, laser light that goes in the interferometer is actually going in this way. So the laser light comes in this way but the squeeze vacuum is coming in this way, which then goes into the dark port of the interferometer. So you don't actually squeeze the laser light itself, uh, but you squeeze the vacuum fluctuations that go into the uh, dark port of the interferometer, the asymmetric port, as we call it. The reason for that is that the laser fluctuations that come in with the laser uh, are split equally at the beam splitter. So the two arms of the interferometer experience those fluctuations uh, in the same amount. And ultimately what you measure is the difference in the noise between the two arms. So any noise that comes in with the laser in principle is common to the two arms and cancels out. However, there are vacuum fluctuations that come in the asymmetric port, <clears throat> which create differential fluctuations in the two arms. And it's those fluctuations that we care about. It's those fluctuations that we have to squeeze to reduce the noise. So that's why we have to send the squeeze light in, in on that side. <clears throat> now, how much did it improve things by? Well, here's the result from that paper. Uh, the black curve here is the uh, reference noise. So it's the noise in the interferometer without squeezing. 
And so improvements to this, we'll see the noise level go down. So we want the noise to decrease so that we can see our signals better. Um, so the green curve is the quantum enhanced sensitivity. This is the noise that you get when you inject uh, phase squeezing. And so you can see the noise at high frequency down to a few tens of hertz <clears throat> is decreased by a little bit. So that is reducing uh, shot noise. Uh, so that's a very exciting result. And this has actually been implemented in the advanced LIGO detectors. It's been implemented in the Virgo detector um, as well. And if you notice carefully, if you look at this carefully, you'll notice that at low frequency, so over here, the green curve actually gets slightly worse than the black curve. And that's actually not an accident. That's not just by chance. Uh, what's going on there is that the phase squeezing is actually making the radiation pressure noise a little bit worse. And the radiation pressure noise is actually not the dominant noise source, but it does contribute a little bit. And so when you squeeze the phase quadrature, you make the amplitude noise worse, that increases the radiation pressure noise, which actually has an observable um, change uh, to the noise floor at those low frequencies. Um, so in the future, um, what will be done, and this is being worked on as we speak, um, you can actually make uh, light, which is phase squeezed at high frequency and amplitude squeezed at low frequency, so that the, the green curve should go below the black curve at all frequencies. You can do this using a filter cavity, uh, which is essentially an optical cavity detuned from resonance. And if you pick uh, the properties of the cavity very carefully, you can make it transition between uh, phase and amplitude squeezing in a frequency dependent way so that you can reduce the quantum noise at all frequencies simultaneously. So that's being uh, constructed uh, right now. <clears throat> now, when you think of um, shot noise and radiation pressure noise together, um, when you vary the power, you get a noise spectrum. When you include both, it looks uh, like this, this plot here on the top right. Uh, so when you have low power, uh, you're essentially just limited by shot noise everywhere. As you start to increase the power, shot noise goes down, radiation pressure noise goes up, and you can keep doing that at higher and higher power levels. So as we go from yellow to red to blue to green, that's higher and higher power. And what you'll notice is that at each frequency, there is an optimal power level to give you the best sensitivity. So at low frequency, it will be a relatively low power. At higher frequency, it will be at a higher power. But basically, just by changing the power, there's a limit uh, to the sensitivity that you can't go below. And that limit is what we refer to as a standard quantum limit. And it is not always a limit, but it's a limit under certain assumptions. And the, the key assumption uh, here is that the imprecision noise or the shot noise that we've been talking about is uncorrelated to the radiation pressure or back action noise. If those two noises are uncorrelated, the SQL uh, places a limit on your sensitivity. Now, if you are clever, you can beat this limit in a variety of different ways. If you introduce correlations between shot noise and radiation pressure noise, that's one way. You can also change uh, the response of the test mass uh, to forces, which will change the radiation pressure noise level, and you can play some tricks uh, with that. Uh, so in advanced LIGO, they actually, using squeeze light, we're able to create correlations between the amplitude, uh, between the shot noise and radiation pressure noise. So if you send in uh, squeezed light, which is not purely amplitude squeezed or phase squeezed, but is squeezed at some mixture of the two, it has the effect of creating correlations between uh, the back action noise and the shot noise. And so what you see in this plot, again, the black curve here is the unsqueeze, the noise with no squeezing. The green is the inferred quantum noise with squeezing injected at some 35 degree angle. And so you can see it's actually making shot noise worse. The high frequency noise is getting worse. Um, the low frequency noise is getting a little better, but there's this dip uh, around 40 Hertz 
uh, where the uh, the reason it's dipping is there's actually correlations between the radiation pressure noise at low frequency, the shot noise at uh, higher frequency. At 40 hertz, those correlations coherently cancel uh, a large part of the noise, and you get this dip in the total quantum noise. And it actually goes below uh, the standard quantum limit by something like uh, 3 dB. Uh, now, there is um, some uh, caveats to this result. Uh, one is this is the inferred quantum noise. So the actual thermal noise of the detectors have been uh, subtracted out here in order to see this effect. But it is true that the total quantum noise was observed to go below the standard quantum limit here using squeeze light to create correlations between the different quadratures. <clears throat> All right, so at this point, we will move on to describing some of the LSU experiments. So everything I, I talked to up to this point uh, were results from the, the LIGO and Virgo uh, detectors. Um, <clears throat> but here we will move on to the LSU experiments. So the idea behind these series of experiments that we are performing at LSU is that we want a sort of tabletop scale prototype experiment where we can uh, create um, a, an optical cavity where radiation pressure noise is important, where the standard quantum limit can be observed so that we can actually test out different ideas for how to reduce radiation pressure noise, for how to beat the standard quantum limit on a small scale before they go and get installed on the billion dollar uh, detector. So <clears throat> we want a, a small table type, tabletop uh, prototype experiment, uh, which is still limited by all these interesting quantum effects so that we can explore different ideas for how to do better. Um, so in order to make these effects observable for on a uh, small scale experiment, we actually wanted to make our mirrors, our test masses, as small and light as possible so that the effects of radiation pressure are as extreme as possible. So we've constructed these devices. Uh, here you see the little diagram. We have mirrors that are about 70 microns in diameter, uh, supported by a cantilever, which is 55 microns long, eight microns wide, and um, I think it's this 220 nanometers thick. So it's very, very tiny mirror about the size of the diameter of a human hair, supported by a very, very thin uh, cantilever. <clears throat> um, the mirror itself is composed of alternating layers of gallium arsenide and aluminum gallium arsenide. And the reason we go with this material is it has very high optical quality. We need a very high reflectivity with very low optical losses. Optical losses destroy all the interesting quantum effects that we're looking for, so we are very careful about that. Uh, but we also need to have low mechanical loss, so low internal friction in the material, uh, because that is what determines how much thermal noise there is in the system. And the real hard part of these experiments is getting the thermal noise to be smaller than the quantum effects that you're trying to explore. <clears throat> So the strategy here was to make these devices uh, suspended by the cantilever uh, as softly uh, supported as possible. So in other words, to make these as floppy as possible. And that has the effect of minimizing the thermal noise um, as it's related to the quantum effects. So these things um, have resonant, resonance frequencies in the range of a few hundred hertz up to a, a kilohertz or a few kilohertz. But basically, we take one of these devices, which was made by, by Garrett Cole, and put them in an optical cavity, and then perform measurements on it to observe these quantum effects. Um, that's the basic idea here. Now, one effect, uh, which will be important uh, when we talk about how we can beat the standard quantum limit, is the optical spring effect. So when you have an optical cavity, and so an optical cavity is essentially two, two mirrors uh, facing each other so that the light gets trapped between them. If the cavity is resonant, the light as it circulates will coherently, constructively interfere with itself and build up, which is what we're seeing in the top plot here. And the radiation pressure that you experience is simply proportional to that power level. 
And so if you're exactly at the peak of this resonance, um, you will get a constant uh, radiation pressure, which will push the mirrors back, uh, but doesn't really change the dynamics of the system. On the other hand, if you uh, detune the cavity so that maybe you're sitting on this side of it, when the mirrors of the cavity move, the power inside the cavity changes linearly in response. And so the force of radiation pressure will also change in response to that. And that's what's shown at the bottom here. So it's essentially the slope of the power in the cavity gives you this uh, flux uh, dynamic force, uh, which will act on the mirror. So that point would correspond to something over here. Uh, so basically, if you imagine you're operating detuned on that side, if the cavity fluctuates to be a little bit longer, so let's say the mirror vibrates to make the cavity longer, the power in the cavity will decrease, which will decrease the radiation pressure force, and the mirror will effectively be pulled back in a little bit. On the other hand, if the mirror vibrates to be too short, there will be more power built up in the cavity, and the radiation pressure will try to push the mirror uh, back outward. Uh, so this actually looks like a spring force. It looks like Hooke's law. So we call this an optical spring effect. Uh, and depending on which side of the cavity you operate, you can make this either a restoring force or an anti-restoring force. So we normally operate on the side that makes this a restoring force. So we'll, we'll come back to the optical spring uh, in a little bit. Uh, in order to observe uh, some of these effects, we have to operate the system cryogenically to reduce the thermal fluctuations uh, in the cantilever position. Uh, so this is just a rough schematic of how we do that. <clears throat> uh, you see there's a cryostat. We actually use a, a closed cycle cryostat. That, that cool, it cools down to about 4 Kelvin. It's connected through this copper rod into our vacuum tank. Uh, which then through a series of heat links is, is connected to the little chip, uh, which holds our, our mirrors on the cantilevers. And once you go through all these different stages, we actually get down to around 20 Kelvin or so um, at best. Uh, here is what it looks like in real life. Uh, so here is the, on the left side, this is the cryostat arm sticking in. You can see little heat links here. Uh, the optical cavity is in this uh, purple circle. The laser light uh, comes in through one of the viewports, hits a mirror, uh, and is steered onto the cavity. Um, you can see all of this sits on a, a breadboard. In this picture, you notice the breadboard is just sitting on the vacuum tank. Uh, due to vibrations, we actually had to suspend the whole breadboard. So now you see we have this extra little triangular cage. And it's, it's kind of hard to see, but the legs of it don't touch the breadboard. They go all the way down uh, to the vacuum tank. And there are actually wires here, here, and here that are supporting the breadboard. So the whole breadboard is suspended off the bottom of the tank in order to isolate from the vibrations, uh, both of the cryostat, but also just from the room. <clears throat> All right, so we built this thing. Uh, what did we see? Uh, the first thing that we saw, which was a, a major milestone for us, that was uh, really 15 years in the making, something like that, was just observing the quantum back action noise. So just observing the quantum radiation pressure noise. So as I mentioned, it's typically very hard to do this. Um, one, because radiation pressure is typically small. Uh, light does not exert very strong forces. You know, when you go outside on a sunny day, you don't feel the pressure of the sunlight pushing you down. It is pushing you down. It's just such a small effect uh, that you don't notice it. So radiation pressure is small then you need it to be quantum. So it's not just the static average radiation pressure, but it's the quantum fluctuations in the radiation pressure that you need to see. So it's extremely small, and, and you have to, to, to get that noise to be larger than the thermal fluctuations of the device. So we were finally able to do this. Um, this came out back in 2018, 2019. Uh, this is a, the measurement. Uh, the orange curve under the black curve is the total predicted noise, uh, included, including radiation pressure. 
whereas the red noise is just the thermal noise. So you can see that the noise we observe uh, agrees with thermal noise plus radiation pressure noise. This experiment was actually done at room temperature, so the cryostat um, was not used uh, for this result um, because we didn't need to. Uh, essentially, we were able to expose the radiation pressure noise without uh, cryogenically uh, cooling the thing. Um, one thing I will point out is you see these different resonance peaks. So you see one at it's at four and a half kilohertz, one at about 15 kilohertz, and another one at uh, almost 30 kilohertz. Those correspond to the mechanical resonances of the mirror cantilever system. Uh, so for example, the four and a half kilohertz one is the yaw mode. So it's the cantilever twisting uh, side to side. The 15 kilohertz is pitch. So it's sort of uh, bending front to back. And then the 30 kilohertz one is a side to side motion. Um, and at this point of the experiment, it wasn't very easy for us to, to minimize those effects. So you see those modes show up quite strongly. Um, of course, once we saw the quantum back action noise, one of the things we wanted to do was look at ways to reduce it, to make more sensitive measurements. And as we've talked about, using squeeze light is one of the first obvious ways to do that. So we worked with uh, David McLaughlin's group from the Australian National University to uh, demonstrate the reduction of quantum radiation pressure noise using squeeze light. So they sent a student, uh, Minjet Yap, to LSU to build a squeeze light source and interface it uh, to our system, which, uh, as you might imagine, is not an easy task. But after a while, we were able to get this uh, working. And here, uh, the black trace is the noise um, with no squeezing. Uh, and so it's, it's limited by radiation pressure noise. If we do amplitude squeezing, so this is the opposite of what Advanced LIGO did. They did phase squeezing to reduce shot noise. If, but we do amplitude squeezing. It reduces that radiation pressure noise. So we've driven that down. And if we do phase squeezing, we actually amplify the radiation pressure noise. So we actually see the noise uh, get worse in that plot there. <clears throat> uh, so this was a demonstration uh, that radiation pressure noise can actually be reduced with amplitude squeezing, which had not been done uh, before, I believe. All right, so we also did an alternative method to evade this back action noise. And so basically the idea is that <clears throat> um, the shot noise and radiation pressure noise can be correlated if you measure different quadratures of the field coming out of the experiment. Uh, so basically there does exist some combination of the phase and amplitude fluctuations where the shot noise and radiation pressure noise are correlated. And if you measure very precisely at that at that point, the radiation pressure fluctuations will cancel out. And we were able to do that in this experiment. It actually turns out that all you have to do is measure the cavity and transmission. And when you go through the calculations, the radiation pressure noise will cancel out. Uh, and you can see that the sensitivity that we achieved slightly improved. Um, so that's the difference between the two plots um, on the right. On the left, you see a plot of um, the noise contributions from quantum noise, thermal noise at different quadratures. And one thing you'll notice, uh, this is all scaled to shot noise. There's this little region right here where the total noise goes below shot noise. And what that's telling you is that this device actually creates squeeze light itself. Uh, so although you can create squeezed light using a nonlinear crystal and then inject it into the system to manipulate the radiation pressure noise, it's also possible using this device to create squeezing itself. Uh, and so that's something we wanted to do and see. <clears throat> and so we collaborated uh, with the MIT group. Uh, they had a student, uh, Nancy Agarwal, come to LSU to do this where we observed this uh, optomechanical or ponder motive uh, squeezing. So basically the main modification here 
is we take a pick off of the laser beam, send it to the output of the cavity to act as a local oscillator. And then by varying the phase between the light that comes out of the cavity and the local oscillator, you can measure different quadratures of the cavity light to try to see this squeezing effect. Uh, so that's what we did. And after a lot of hard work, we were able to do this measurement where we measured the total noise uh, to be below the shot noise level coming out of the cavity in this frequency band from about 30 kilohertz to 60 kilohertz. So this was a demonstration of optomechanical or ponder mode of squeezing uh, at room temperature still. There's no cryogenics yet. This is all still room temperature. Uh, now it's not a lot of squeezing. It's about half a dB, which is not very much, uh, especially compared to what crystals can do. And this is limited by things like the optical losses in the system, the residual thermal noise, and uh, some phase noise that we had. Now, those are actually all technical problems. Those can all be improved. So if you do some extrapolations, uh, it is actually possible to make a ponder mode of squeezer that could be competitive with the uh, nonlinear crystal-based squeezers, but that uh, would require some work. Um, one interesting thing is that you can actually confirm that this is squeezed by uh, splitting the squeeze beam onto two photodetectors and looking at the correlations between those two detectors. If there's no squeezing, the noise in the two detectors would be uncorrelated. Uh, it would just be shot noise. If there's classical noise in the system, you should observe positive correlations. In other words, if this laser beam uh, has classical flu uh, intensity fluctuations, it would be split equally in both directions. And when one photodetector sees more light, so would the other one, so you'd see positive correlations. It turns out if you do amplitude squeezing, you actually get negative correlations between the two photodetectors. So that's a very clear signature of squeezed light. So we were able to do that measurement and infer how much squeezing we had, which agreed with our, our previous result. Uh, so now we'll move on. Uh, to the final result, the uh, beating the standard quantum limit. Um, so to do this, we, we now did have to cryogenically cool the device. Uh, so basically, the thermal noise at room temperature is bigger than the standard quantum limit, so it's impossible to do um, at room temperature. So we had to cool it down. Um, so... That unfortunately comes with lots of challenges. Uh, the closed cycle uh, cryostat comes with lots of vibrations. Uh, and also when you start to cool things down, any residual particles in your vacuum chamber will st stick to the cold things. Uh, and we basically had a lot of problems dealing uh, <laughs> with these. But we are able to work around those problems and make the measurements. So, there are two big changes to the experimental layout compared to the previous results. The first is that we have the cryostat operating now so that we cool the thing down to the range of uh, 20 or 30 Kelvin. The other thing we had to do was uh, build a, a uh, measurement uh, scheme to measure the laser frequency noise. So at the more sensitive uh, measurements, the laser frequency noise becomes a big limitation and so we actually do this using a, an imbalanced um, mox ender interferometer. It's like a delay line interferometer where we'll, we split the beam into two. Uh, one of the paths of the interferometer goes through a 100 meter long optical fiber. And then we recombine the beams and measure those on photodetectors. And any laser frequency fluctuations, um, because they spend more time in the longer arm of that interferometer, they build up a phase difference, which you can then measure and subtract or, or suppress or do whatever to eliminate the laser frequency noise. So those are the major, major changes that we had to do um, for this. And once you do that, um, if you run the cavity at lower power at, and put, you know, we want to beat the standard quantum limit. And the way that we have to beat the standard quantum limit, you could do it by injecting squeeze light, but it was easier for us to do it using the optical spring effect. So basically that optical spring effect that I described earlier, if we make the resonance of that optical spring at a particular frequency, 
the cavity will respond more strongly to fluctuations at that frequency. It will become more sensitive um, at that frequency. So basically the optical spring resonance enhances the sensitivity uh, at, the, at, its, at that frequency. And so by putting the optical spring resonance at a place where we expect the thermal noise to be below the standard quantum limit, we predicted that we should be able to measure a total sensitivity that's below the standard quantum limit. And this is the measurement uh, showing that. So the standard quantum limit is shown in this black trace. And you can see that we have quantum and thermal contributions uh, from our models. And then the measured noise is shown in blue. And it does, in fact, uh, go below the SQL uh, by a small factor um, at this 60, 70 kilohertz range. Um, and this is not using squeeze light, but it's using the optical spring effect. So it's a different method um, than what the advanced LICO result was in the beginning where they use squeeze light. Now, <clears throat> uh, advanced LIGO could do this too. They could create an optical spring by detuning the optical cavities in the interferometer. Uh, there's a couple of reasons why we don't necessarily want to do that right now. Uh, the first is it creates a lot of complications in how you operate and control uh, the interferometer. The second is there are other noise sources like thermal noise um, that even if you were able to operate the system with this optical spring and make the quantum noise small, if the thermal noise is bigger, you don't really get any benefit anyway. So until we make some other improvements, there's not really any great advantage uh, to doing this in advanced LIGO yet. Now, one of the advantages of the optical spring is that it's tunable. It's not just a mechanical resonance that's fixed uh, by the dimensions of the system. It's something that we can manipulate by controlling either the power in the cavity or the detuning of the cavity. Uh, so for example, if we change the detuning of the cavity to make the optical spring move from 40 kilohertz up to 90 kilohertz, you get a sensitivity which changes depending on where that resonance is. And you can see that our performance uh, in, at the low frequencies gets better when we have a low frequency optical spring. And then as we move it higher, we beat the SQL at a higher and higher frequency. Um, and so in principle, in the future, uh, it's not really possible today, but in the future, if you knew a gravitational wave was coming, and the gravitational wave is not just at a single frequency, but these in spirals start at low frequency and then go up to higher frequency in a chirp pattern. If you know it's coming, maybe for example, you have a space-based detector where you measure the very low frequency gravitational waves and you predict when, when it's going to happen or you can observe it very early, you could actually have your interferometer in real time change the optical spring frequency to have the peak sensitivity track the gravitational wave signal. Uh, so that would give you a way to make more sensitive measurements. Of course, I say it like it's trivial to do all that, but <laughs> there's a lot of challenges in doing that, but it is in principle uh, possible. Uh, so that is where I will stop. So the conclusions are that quantum noise, including back action, are now dominant noise sources in gravitational wave interferometers. And that will continue to be true in the future. At LSU, we've developed a system in collaboration uh, with others that's capable of exploring uh, technologies to improve the sensitivity uh, in the presence of the, these limitations. Uh, now, the coatings, the mirrors that we use, the Algas coatings, I should mention, are also being considered for future gravitational wave uh, detectors because of their lower mechanical loss, which would lower the thermal noise um, that comes from the coatings. So at this point, I will thank you for your attention and I um, welcome any additional uh, questions. And of course, I should mention that this research is supported by the National Science Foundation. So thank you. Yeah, very nice. Uh, thank you very much, Thomas, for that excellent informative presentation. Again, as Thomas reminded, uh, feel free to add some questions to the Q&A. We already have a few that I'll, I'll start reading off. So I'm gonna go back down to one of the first ones. Um, can you go into or give some additional details on the um, uh, shot noise, the photon counting noise, and why that exists in the first place? Yeah, so... Um, it is a very basic feature of um, 
quantum mechanics. Uh, quantum mechanics tells us that uh, the electromagnetic field uh, light waves are broken into discrete quanta photons. Um, and so we measure um, any optical measurement where you measure a power on a photodetector, you're counting photons. You're measuring how many photons hit the detector in a certain amount of time. And you either measure a photon or you don't. You measure, you can measure zero, you can measure one, you can measure two, you can't measure half a photon. Um, so uh, if light were purely a wave, uh, this would not be a limitation. So when you send the light in the interferometer um, to a beam splitter, it would split equally in both directions and there'd be no, no shot noise effect. But because it's broken into these discrete packets, um, you get fluctuations. So in this picture of, of LIGO, the way to understand this is you have the laser power coming in and imagine you're a photon and you get to this beam splitter. Do you get reflected or do you get transmitted? Um, you do one or the other. Now there are all sorts of subtleties in what, in what really goes on quantum mechanically, but basically um, because the light is composed of discrete packets, you get this, this fluctuating number of photons um, and you can't understand it classically. It, it is purely a quantum mechanical effect. Yeah, very nice. Um, let's stay sort of on a similar topic there. So I'm gonna combine two of the questions now. So one was just elaborating more on the SQL. So I guess going now from the shot noise side to the uh, adding in the radi radiation pressure noise. And then just before I uh, hand it off, uh, what level of laser frequency noise? So I don't know if that's gonna be both like intensity noise, frequency noise, what, what sort of laser specifications would you need to ultimately beat the SQL um, on top of the other requirements in the experiment? Yeah, so the SQL, um, if you go back to the, so this is a limitation in any continuous measurement. So if you go back to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, and it may be easier to understand it in the in the frame of position and momentum. So LIGO essentially does position measurements, but not just once, over and over again. So imagine you perform a very, very precise position measurement of an object. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle tells you that the momentum of that object has to be very uncertain uh, because of quantum mechanics. Now, that doesn't change your first measurement, but what happens when you make your next measurement? Well, that momentum uncertainty has time to translate into position uncertainty. So your next position measurement will be uncertain as a result of your first one not being uncertain. And so there's this trade-off that if you perform a very, very precise position measurement, you create momentum fluctuations, which in turn create position fluctuations. Whereas if you make a very weak position measurement, you don't disturb the momentum very much um, so you don't get very much of this back action noise. And the SQL is just balancing those two effects. It's making the measurement strong enough that your position uncertainty is not too bad, but not so strongly that you make the back action noise uh, a problem. Uh, and so that is just the balance between those two things. Um, but again, it can be beaten by um, taking advantage of correlations between the two or changing how the test mass responds to forces. Um, so I think the other question was, uh, what sort of frequency noise is needed uh, to beat the SQL? So in, there may be two parts to that. Uh, for advanced LIGO, of course, the frequency noise requirement is going to be much, much more stringent than in our experiments because the arm cavities are so long and you're reaching a, a smaller, uh, better sensitivity. But the advanced LIGO has the advantages of being able to use the common motion of the two arms as a frequency reference to stabilize to. Uh, so they can, uh, I don't know the number, um, off the top of my head, but they, they have very, very precise, uh, very low frequency noise. For us, um, we use this optical fiber setup to reduce our frequency noise, uh, which to be fair is actually terrible at low frequency. So at, you know, uh, tens of Hertz, hundred Hertz, um, there are all kinds of 
acoustic couplings, thermal drifting, it's very, very possible we make the frequency noise worse at low frequencies. But the measurement that we're actually doing is at tens of kilohertz. And at those frequencies, this sort of technique works totally fine um, for us. So I believe the uh, free running frequency noise of the laser is something like, um, uh, I wanna say 10 hertz per square root hertz um, at a kilohertz, something like that. And we reduce it by a factor of a hundred or a thousand uh, for, for this purpose. Yeah, no, very nice. Um, next question I'll jump to, since we have the, the world's foremost expert here, um, when can you make a historical comment on the optical spring? Like, do you know of early references on optical spring effects? Um, yeah, so um, I, the, the, the historical references I, I would point out to, um, I, I don't recall which one is first, uh, so. <laughs> That's I'll what we want to hold you to it. That's okay, people. yeah. <laughs> um, there are some very old uh, Russian references from Vladimir Brzezinski uh, talking about um, this uh, optical bi-stability effect is what it was called. Um, and I wanna say that might even go all the way back to like the seventies um, when it was first mentioned. It was also explored uh, by Pierre Maestre's group um, a bit later than that, I believe. Um, so they, they describe this optical bi-stability. So basically you'd get different stable points depending on how the cavity was detuned and it would sort of have some self-locking features or on things like that related to the optical spring. Uh, and then starting in sort of the early 2000s, we started to make um, really strong optical springs. So the one thing that we do differently, both in the LSU experiment, but also in sort of the gravitational wave field is we make optical springs that are very, very strong compared to the mechanical stiffness of the system. So for example, um, in this experiment, the mechanical resonance is about a kilohertz. So if you disturb the little mirror on a resonator, it, it vibrates at a kilohertz. The optical spring has a resonance frequency. Uh, the highest we go is about 200, 300 kilohertz. So the optical spring is actually uh, what is that? That's um, a factor of 200 squared. So that's 10,000, 100 times, 100,000 times stronger than the mechanical spring supporting the system. If you do the calculations, now advanced LIGO doesn't use the optical spring, but if they did, if they detune their cavity to create it, it would have uh, a stiffness equivalent of to replacing the laser beam with a bar of diamond that connected the test masses. So that's a very, very strong effect um, uh, nowadays. Oh, very cool. Yeah, I ended up sending a comment with, yeah, Pierre Meister from University of Arizona and then Vladimir Briginsky to the, the yeah. question. So final question here uh, before we let you go is, yeah, just some comments on vibration isolation. So it was a really neat, you know, solution to suspend the um, breadboard in the vacuum chamber. Do you see any advantages to using, say, active vibration isolation or any, um, yeah, what are the next steps in improving vibration isolation if that is a, an issue? Yeah, so so I should say I'm actually very proud of that we were able to do this because we actually installed this vibration isolation system with the whole cavity already in place and set up. We basically suspended the thing while trying to not misalign everything, which we were actually successful in doing. Um, but it's completely passive. Um, so it's just suspended on wires. The pendulum effect uh, gives you some vibration isolation. We do use, I don't know if you can see it in this picture, but we use eddy current damping to damp out the resonances of the suspension mode. Um, so there are little magnets that are also suspended hanging down next to little uh, conductors, which uh, through eddy currents, stamp out the resonances of the of the suspension. But this is a very crude suspension uh, vibration isolation technique. Um, we are still limited by the resonances. It does not isolate from the cryostat, cryostat vibrations well enough. So, for example, to actually run the system cryogenic, 
quickly, we cool cool it down. And then to make the measurements, we actually have to turn the cryostat off. Otherwise, the cryostat disturbs the measurement too much. Um, so there would be a lot of advantages uh, to having a more advanced uh, vibration isolation system, either through active isolation or through more, um, more advanced uh, suspensions. And I see, for example, in this noise budget, we measure down to around 100 hertz, and we don't really have, you know, all this noise is explained by thermal noise and uh, quantum noise. There's not really any vibrational component until you go below 100 hertz. Uh, now, once you cryogenically cool, um, I don't know if we have the plot for that, uh, that changes a little bit because the noises that we're looking at, the quantum noise and thermal noise, are smaller. So we're more sensitive to vibrations at this point. So it is a, a bigger limitation for us um, in cryogenic operation. It would definitely be a, a place where we can improve. Yeah, uh, very nice. I still think it's... Uh... You call it crude, but it looked like a very nice solution. Like it was uh, well done. And impressive that you were able to do this without misaligning the optics. So, yes. <laughs> oh, very cool. Well, thanks again, Thomas, for that very nice presentation. Thank you, everyone who attended and uh, submitted questions. Uh, that's all the time we have for today. But let's again thank Thomas virtually <laughs> for that nice yeah, right. presentation. Um, I'll make a quick plug that on December 14th, we have a webinar on diffraction gratings 101 uh, types and applications presented by Thor Labs very own Eric uh, Haberman. I hope I pronounced that properly. Uh, and you can register for this event again on thorlabs.com slash webinars. Um, so yeah, thank you again, everyone. And I hope that you have a great day. Thanks to Thomas. Uh, goodbye.